This is a download from Triple J. For more music, current affairs, comedy and culture, triplej.net.au. And now... King Hit. Archive interviews from the vaults of Triple J. Hi, this is Shirley Manson from Garbage and you're listening to Triple G. Shirley Manson of Garbage, welcome back to Australia. How are you? Good, thank you. How's your stay been? When did you get here? Um, this morning. Oh, okay. Wow. Yeah. So you're only here for a few days doing promo mm-hmm. and all that sort of stuff. Travelling to other parts of the world? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, going on to Singapore on Friday. Okay. Yeah. And then any other parts of Asia? And then Japan. Right. And okay. then Madison. And then Madison. Yeah. Speaking of which, this is where you were camped for uh, a substantial part of last year. Madison, Wisconsin, recording yeah. the second album by Garbage. I actually read that in Wisconsin they've got the largest proportion of overweight people in the states. I want you to conf- <laughs> I want you to confirm this for us right now. That actually is true, and they also have the the highest rate of uh, mass murderers, I think, in, in the United States. So, yeah, it's a weird it's a weird part of the world. I wonder if the two go hand in hand for any reason. No, I'm sure they don't. Actually, I've not seen any fat people in... <laughs> fat people, what a terrible thing to say. But I've never seen any massively overweight people in, in the Midwest. I, I really haven't. It certainly, it hasn't struck me as being any more prevalent than anywhere else. In the States, you mean? In the States. Yeah. The States do have a reputation for eating big and being big as well. And when I read that, I thought, gee, there must be some big people in Wisconsin. Yeah, I, I, I must admit, it's never really struck me. Okay. What about the mass murdering side of it? Is there a weird vibe? Is there a weird vibe in this state? Uh, no, no, and I, not at all. I mean, the people are so nice, but uh, yeah, I don't know. I think the Wisconsin is a the dairy state, so there's a lot of farms and a lot of you know isolation, and I think that sends people potty. Really? Yeah. I don't. Isolation in the states is a weird thing because it's so much heavily populated than Australia. It's kind of weird to think that a country with two hundred and fifty million people, you could be isolated anywhere within it. Yeah, but the country is huge. Let's let's not forget how big it is. And, because you know, Australia, it's the same size as Australia. Yeah, really? Yeah, I know that's the incredible thing, isn't it? Really? Yeah, we've got twenty million or approaching twenty million people. They've got two hundred and fifty million people. Wow. Yeah. Australia is that big. It is that big. My God, yeah. I had no idea. Yeah. It's a big place. So um, uh, what are the three guys like then in Garbage? That's where they live. Uh, do they reflect the state in any way, do you think? Um, well, only Butch is the only one who actually comes from Wisconsin. So I think he's he's uh, <laughs> an anomaly. I don't think he's like anybody else. So <laughs> I can't really see. Yeah. You were st- you, how long were you staying there making this second album? On and off for about a year. When did you finish it? Because you began it last April, April 97. Mm-hmm. So you must have finished it just earlier this year, did you? Yeah, in February. Wow. Okay. So you're going to get it out there pretty quick. Yeah. 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 But I, I need to get it out. I'm, 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 I'm well over it. It's time to move on. Uh, a year in the studio. A year in the studio making the album. Was it too long? Um, well, not really, because we didn't really get much work done in the first few months. So, um, I, I, I mean, I, we were in no rush really we wanted to make a good record so we had to take our time we're, we're not a you know we're not a conveyor belt we're not a factory yeah and uh we knew we had to come up with a strong follow-up because we'd had so much success with the first record so you know we wanted to make sure we Did give right. ourselves the best shot you know it's not in life you're so lucky if you know to have one successful record you're so you know you don't want to squander the opportunity of bringing out a follow-up and Knowing, f- you know, we know that we'll we'll have some attention, which is so rare for bands. You know, that we're guaranteed of attention at least. I mean, there's no guarantee that people will like it, but we know people are going to get to hear it, which is rare. How su- how surprising was that for you personally? That success that uh, built up behind that first album. <laughs> well, I, I, you know, I don't know if you. I, I was in a band for ten years, where nobody gave a damn. Nobody listened to what we did, and and so. To have all of a sudden be in a band where people were like getting into it and buying the record, and you know, it was b- totally bizarre. I mean, I'd never expected it to happen. Did it go to your head? Um, I don't believe it has. I suppose you'd be better asking other people who knew me, but I, do, I don't think so. I don't think I've let it affect me that way. And do you think that the 10 years you, you spent trying to get somewhere in music in another band, do you think that prepared you so that oh, you didn't? Undoubtedly. I mean, it's a sobering experience being in a band that, that you know, that that 
goes on for years and years and years and, and you never really get anybody to come to your concerts. Is that the band called the Mackenzies? <laughs> yeah, good band, uh, Mr. Mackenzie. Yeah, this is back in Scotland. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, do you think, or did you think at the time that you were good, that you deserved to get recognition, wider recognition? I don't know. I can't really remember. I, don't, I know that I, to this day, I think the lead singer was immensely talented. So we had something going for us. So you weren't even the singer in the band? Oh, God, no. No, I was the keyboard player and backing vocalist and backing guitarist. I never wanted to be a singer. When did that change? Well, it never really did. Um, I got, once our, we, Goodbye Mr. McKenzie ran out of deals, you know, we, our last deal fell to the floor and um, we were on the dole. The lead singer of, of the McKenzie said, you're going to have to start singing. You're going to have to take over front vocals and we'll try getting a deal with you singing front vocals, lead <laughs> vocals. I was like, yeah, well, whatever. So I started singing lead vocals and we got a record deal in America. And uh, it was a very dysfunctional band because it wasn't really based on reality or or, or my desires in, at all, and then I got invited to join Garbage. By which time I was used to being a f- you know a front person, um, and then and I joined Garbage, and I've never looked back. I love it. Did it cause much hassle with the other other people in Mackenzie's <clears throat> when you left? No, I think it was a relief for everybody. Actually, I think because uh, nobody believed in the band, it was put together in such a stupid way that. I think everybody was relieved it was over. This band is not your typical band, Garbage, is it? In the way that it's been put together. Uh, No, no. I don't think there's any other band in history came together the way we did. And also just looking at the histories of the individual members, let alone how Mm -hmm. you came together, it's such a unique combination of people, all so talented. And it just sometimes you get talented people together, really talented people, and they won't do anything well together. What what what's the chemistry in garbage? Why does it work? I don't know. I think it's it's really, truly is just personal, and it, uh, as in you know we we found four people that we really get on with, and it's again that's so it doesn't happen very often in life either. We just got we're just lucky. I really believe that. because we came together under such extraordinary circumstances. You know, they saw me on MTV. I mean, how dumb is that? And the the likelihood of them actually liking me and me liking them and getting on and actually being able to be creative together and remain a healthy, functioning group after touring for two years is is bizarre. And, and yeah, I don't quite know how it worked, but it certainly did. But you're not questioning it at Uh -uh. all? Yeah. No. Uh, They have described you in the press, but I've never actually heard your descriptions of them. Just a a word to describe, to sum up, if you can, each of the uh, members of Garbage. Let's start with Butch. What's a word that comes to mind to describe him? Workaholic. (laughs) Okay. Uh, Duke? He's my my happy clown. (laughs) Uh, Two words, that'll do. Happy clown. Is he a bit of a prankster in the band? Oh, he is complete, like, exhibitionist, total exhibitionist and, and comedian. He, I, I'm, not, I'm not kidding you. Every single day, at some given point in the day, uh, he will have me in tears with laughter. Uh, he's my tonic. I, I love him to pieces. There seems to be one in every band. It yeah. needs it, doesn't it? You have to have it. Comic it, relief. Yeah, totally. Yeah. And what about Steve? Steve is a complete weirdo. <laughs> he really is. He is a complete freak for example he's just weird i can't explain it he's just a nutter and he's he's i'm almost bit, like i'm really very close with his wife and we just have so much like jokes at his expense because he's such a nutter and then again i mean i love all of, of the boys in the band they're amazing they're some of the best people i've ever met in my life and i wouldn't have a word said against them i would literally fight somebody who said something mean about them i love them wow that's that's great to have that dedication <laughs> okay and now a word that they would come up with to describe you oh they've come up with them already looney tunes is a favorite one of theirs and um the queen is another and uh b i t c h is another b a t c h b i t c h oh b i t c h it's the accent sorry right okay and you just have to swallow that? I mean, you're surrounded by three guys, I, I guess. I know they love me. Yeah. I know they love me. Do you feel more of the pressure in garbage because you're out front? It's your voice? Uh, sometimes. I mean, yeah, I mean, come. there's pressures that come with what I do. I mean, particularly in America, you know, I'm the absolute focal point of this band and there's a lot of demands on my time and a lot of media attention and that can be hard sometimes but I love what I do I, I, I it's been for the most part an absolute blast and I think if I didn't enjoy it I would stop doing it 
I really don't get with the bands that sit and moan about, oh, it's so awful. Well, go and clean toilets for a living then. You know, I just don't get it. It's I a bit hard it. to swallow for the public too, I think. When I'm sure, yeah. I mean, I, you can't forget how lucky you are and how, how you're living out the dreams of millions. And you've got no right, if you're that, this lucky, to piss and moan about it. Not that I want you to whinge at this point, but what is the hardest thing for people outside of being in a band? What is the hardest thing of being in a band? Travelling. Every day being in a different place, that's really unpleasant. See, a lot of people would think that that would be absolutely wonderful. Well, the actual visiting countries is wonderful, but you never get to see the countries a lot of the time. And you're literally, you you know, you can get very, dis- your life is completely disrupted. You've got nowhere to literally put your handbag. And I know that ladies out there understand <laughs> what I'm talking about. You know, every now and again, during the, there's always a moment in your day when you just want to close the door, sit down, put your feet up. And, and that can rarely happen because there isn't anywhere to, to put your feet up. Would you describe yourself as a very homely person, though? Um, I have bec- I've learned to not be homely. But, when, I mean, I am a homemaker when I'm at home. My house is really, you know, my haven. Your but, kingdom. My kingdom, exactly. Yeah. But, uh, no, I'm very flexible. I've had to learn to be. I'm very self-sufficient. I don't really need a lot to uh, to keep me happy. As clean sheets is a must. And a clean toilet, hopefully. <laughs> clean sheets and a clean toilet. Yeah. Let me just quickly play you something, okay? Okay. Is that an all-time favourite track of yours? It's sublime. It makes me grin every time I hear it. It's Does it really? so amazing. Okay, that's Don't Worry Baby, a hit in 1964 for the Beach Boys. I don't know whether you needed to go to the lengths you did to get approval for this little bit. Anyway, we'll play Push It right now. The, the bit in the song which is familiar to the Beach Boys song we just heard will become apparent. So give us a story. What did you try to do the first time around with the sample? We sampled it off the vinyl and we had the, and the Beach Boys were our backing vocalists and it was amazing, totally brilliant. But uh, our lawyers in our record company were like freaking out saying, you know, the Beach Boys lawyers are going to come down on you like a ton of bricks, you'll get sued, um, you'll delay the release of your record, blah, 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 blah. And it freaked us out. And so I went back in and, and recorded... Um, some back and vocals myself in the vein of the Beach Boys and no we, d- we didn't have to clear it through him but we decided that we should and if he was if he objected to it we would have taken it out because um, we we desperately wanted that little reference in there but um, we didn't want to piss him off so we contacted Brian Wilson himself through our publisher and, and he gave us his blessing and uh, he asked to keep the cassette because he really liked the track, so we were pretty psyched about that. Yeah, exciting. But, well, I mean, you have to be careful, and, and the, 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 the laws of the music industry have not moved with the times, and so you can get hammered big time. I mean, look what happened to The Verve. I think that's horrendous, disgraceful. Their, their song has literally been taken from them and used in advertising against their will, you know, used for car commercials and, you know, sanitary pad commercials and god knows what you know they have no control over their own music and i think simply because they they didn't seek a clearance on a sample and it's a tiny little minute and they've point. made they've made no money made from no money. Bittersweet. but i mean aside from the money and money's almost irrelevant it's the fact that they their music has been re- taken from them and used and abused and i think that's absolutely f- terrifying yeah. You know. Well, now I understand because when I compared the two, uh, besides the fact that "Don't worry, baby" is the common words in each, the melody I didn't think was exactly the same, and I thought, well, they they could have slipped this one out, and no one would have noticed. No, but no, but you know, when you're in a band where you know you're going to get a lot of, uh, you know, attention, you have to be careful because we've already had people come up and try and like, you know. Um, you know, say you used a snare drum sample from our artist, and uh, we want a hundred, you know, grand, and we're going to take you to court, and da 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 da, uh, and that was an inaccuracy. It's if somebody has a, you know, a genuine grievance, they're gonna, they're gonna haul you over the coals, and we're not gonna, we're not gonna subject ourselves to that. We're not gonna allow people to come in and tamper with what we do. 
or like try and freak us out and put us in court for six months. We don't need that in our lives. So we'd rather make a smart decision up front and clear any worries that we might have and know that, that we're not going to get hassle. Yeah. You didn't have any bad experiences with the first album, did you, in terms of this sampling? Uh, no, but we had a track on, on a soundtrack uh, for Romeo and Juliet, actually, and uh, we had it remixed for the movie and um, some band in the UK tried to come at us for money and said, uh, you used a drum loop or something like this in, in our track, in your track. And we were like, nah, nah, no, we didn't. And we knew we hadn't. Yeah. But uh, they they try anything these days to try and make some money off bands. Yeah, yeah you're right. Whenever you get a lot of money, there's a lot of people there looking at the money, wanting a cut of it yeah. in any way they can. Are there many samples on this new album? We'd, yeah, but we we in the end made our own samples. We decided we had to because, like, like I said, we were running the risk of getting hammered so hmm. you've used some live strings too in one track which is a favorite already medication yeah. it's a beautiful track isn't it you've done something weird to the strings though haven't you yeah and a lot well there's strings and there's also guitars that have been processed to sound like strings so you've got this weird little sort of discordant um orchestrated piece in the in the choruses yeah it's actually guitars and it's strings. quite a weird sound it's quite eerie yeah, I yeah. love that song. It's one of my favourites, actually. Do you like talking about the meanings behind songs? Can I ask you what medication is about? Um, well, in general, we don't particularly like talking about the actual meanings, although medication works on so many different levels. I mean, obviously, I mean, it's, it's personal, but it was also about when I, I was in the States and I got sick and uh, I had no, you know, no health insurance and no doctor to go to and I was all by myself in the States and I didn't, I was so far from home and I was scared out of my wits and I didn't know what to do and nobody would even look at me until I could prove that I could pay for m me medical coverage and it and they sent me away and you know without treating me because I didn't have the money or I didn't have proof of insurance so I had to wait till the weekend was over so I could contact you know our record company and get all the paperwork that I needed and I sat in my hotel room and I was terrified to death and and I couldn't believe that a country could exist like that, you know, where people will not be cared for if they don't have cash. And so the record was kind of the the song was written in my hotel room as and it sort of in the process cheered me up because I thought, oh, this is a great little song. <laughs> but uh, for the most part, I was totally freaked. Out. Something good came from the bad. Yeah. But that, it's a sign of, in a way, a very inhumane society, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, where I come from in the UK, you know, we have a, a wonderful national health service that's been sadly depleted by, uh, well, first the Tories and now the Labour government doesn't seem to be doing much to help it either. And uh, I, I just don't un don't think they understand how precious, you know, the national health service is. And I think if a country can't prove to its people that it cares about them. How can they possibly expect society to be healthy and happy and safe? I mean, it may, if people believe that their state doesn't give a damn about them, why should they care about this, the you know the, the society that they live in? It's a two-way thing, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, did you get better after I got, I, you got better straight after writing the song? I guess. Yeah, I got better. Yeah, it was the medication you needed. Yeah. I'm chatting to Shelley Manson from Garbage. Uh, so, you know, I mean, everyone talks about the second album, the difficult second album. It's a hard one to follow up such, you know, a big album, especially the garbage put out a few years ago. Where do you reckon you are with it then? With it being released, it's a bit hard to tell at this stage what the reaction's going to be, but are you confident about it? I don't know. <laughs> There's a lot of singles on here, potential singles anyway. Yeah, I, I think um, we feel we've made a better record, but then again, I, I'm fully aware that all bands say that about their newest release. Um, I think think we feel that we've made a, a more cohesive record and it has more energy and and is much more human sounding even though we used a lot more electronica and a lot more technology we've managed to insert a sort of emotional vein in it that I felt was lacking in the first and I think we've just taken uh, the sound of the band and being able to expand it a little further and there's more dynamics and there's just more you know the songs are more varied it's still, I mean, you hear it and you go, right, that's that's garbage for yeah. a lot of the tracks anyway. There's still that distinctive sound. Good. Did you not want to, you, that is a good thing then. Yeah. Oh, yeah. For for us, for us personally. I mean, I, I, I find it strange that people seem to look to bands now to come up with a new sound with every album. It's like they want, you know, they want a new image, they want new this and that. And for me, when I fell in love with bands, it was because they were like tanks. You know, they came in, 
at me on, on the radio or they came at me from the TV and they were absolute, you know, they just came down a path at you unfaltering, you know, and they didn't get swayed by fashion and they didn't get swayed by other people's opinions. They were a self-contained little unit and I think that's what I hope garbage is going to be. It's not, it's not, you know, we're not trying to be fashionable. Where we want to be here for the long haul and uh, we want to make great records. We're not interested in making a fashion statement. It's funny because in a way, garbage do become a fashion statement in, for whatever reason, just the, the fact that you are a, uh, not a normal band and yeah. you've got a striking image, a striking sound. You've ended up on the front cover of a lot of magazines <laughs> and a lot of very hip magazines too. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we've been lucky, and obviously I'm, I'm talking from a very luxurious position of being fashionable, I suppose. But it's, it's not a concern to us. And I, I think, uh, I think our, our fans like the fact that we do our own thing. We do it our way. We don't do it anybody else's way, and we don't sound like anybody else, and we have an identity that is... It's, it's difficult in today's climate to actually achieve an identity, to stick out from the masses of bands out there. And I don't know how we did it, but somehow we've managed to create our own sound. And that's very important to us. We don't want to lose that. Yeah, and you don't want to turn your back on it. No. And you have inspired, it's funny, you have inspired a few sound alikes too along the way. <laughs> well, that's wonderful. I love that. Okay. Uh, oh, no, it's the last question. Uh, just speaking about bands who do it their way, uh, early pretenders were always very much a cohesive unit. And there's one track on this new album called Special, which I hear it and I go... Are you trying to sing like Chrissy Hind here? Because it reminds me of Chrissy Hind. <laughs> well, that's probably because I quote one of her lyrics at the very end of the song, We Were the Talk of the Town. It's a deliberate, at the very, I mean, the song has nothing to do with the pretenders and nothing to do with her. But at the very end of the song, I wanted to slip in the line, We Were the Talk of the Town, for various reasons, private reasons, whatever. And uh, so, I, again, our lawyers were like, You can't keep this in. I was like, Oh, for God's sake. So I phoned up Chrissy Hind myself. <laughs> And Did you really? Yeah. yeah. And I said, we, you know, we have this song, blah, 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 blah. I slip in one of your lines, do you mind? And she was like, no, of course not. I'm delighted. You know, I love your band, blah, 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 blah. And I said, well, I'll send you the song, see how you feel. And she was like, you don't need to send me the song. I, I'm giving you clearance right now. And I went, no, 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 being anal and, you know, yeah. a perfectionist. I said, no, 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 I'll send it to you anyway. And about five minutes later, in came a fax into the studio and it said, I, Chrissy Hine, do solemnly swear <laughs> that the rock band Garbage can sample my sounds, uh, my voice, or indeed my very ass. <laughs> <laughs> so I have this great letter that I'm going to frame because I love her. She's always been my absolute my all-time heroine. So it was a great compliment. That's fantastic. <laughs> frame it. That, I that will. is brilliant. Yeah, she is terrific. And it was also just the use of the word special as well because that was part of Brass in Pocket too. Yep. Uh, I'm so special. Okay, nice to meet you, Shelley Manson from Garbage. Thank you very much.